Good morning. Uh, really glad to be here this morning. I don't know if you've heard, but Cross Community Church is uh, joining together with Pastor Antonio Correa, who's a, a Venezuelan pastor, and being sent from uh, his church in Venezuela to plant a church in Madrid, Spain. And our pastor, Jason Waymire and his wife, Brittany, actually have the opportunity right now to, to be in Spain with Pastor Antonio and his wife, Daniela, and their seeking out the Lord there, praying for wisdom, and looking for inroads to start a church there in, uh, in Spain. And so we get to be a small part of that in sending him. And so it's a, it's a, a time of celebration for us. It's a neat opportunity that, that we have. And we would cover your prayers for them, um, for travels back to the States, and, and just for wisdom and opportunities as they're there in Spain. But uh, fear not, we have a, a very talented group of men who God, I, I believe, has sent to Cross Community um, to communicate and to, to help us through that process. And so I want to introduce to you Nathan Jager. He has been here before. Yes, give him a round of applause. No, he's a, a, a father of four who's been blessed to be a part of Cross Community, and I would add that we have been blessed to have him here as well. So welcome, Nathan. Thank you, Brandon. Can you give it up for Brandon? Great job. <clears throat> the first service gave it up for him louder, though. So, Brandon, I don't know what that says about this service. No, give it up for him one more time. Thank you, Brandon. I am thankful for the staff of this church and the elders, leadership. Um, it's been a huge blessing to my family. And, I, and then I look around this room, and I'm so thankful, even back to when Josh was praying as he was closing out the worship portion of the service, I'm um, talking about how the enemy's trying to get people, and God is bigger. And I look around this room, and I'm thankful that the enemy's not getting everyone. I look at some marriages in this room, and I think, man, that, those are some great marriages. The enemy's not getting all our marriages. Or I look at young people, even, in this room. And, man, it would seem like the odds are against them, wouldn't it? Like, if you look at the world and how evil and wicked it seems sometimes, and then you have our kids, and it's like, how are they going to make it? But the enemy's not getting all of them. There's a lot of kids in this room, even, um, some servant and kids ministry who come here on Wednesday nights, and they are committed um, and I'm thankful for that, so thankful for that. Um, I want to preach this morning on a different topic, one that I can almost guarantee you've never heard. Um, the title of the message is going to be this, Moses and the Mighty Mississippi. Moses and the Mighty Mississippi. Please don't get up and walk out right now. I know that sounds like a, I don't know, a kid's ministry class or something. I also have to clarify that I know Moses did not float down the Mississippi River as a baby, but I promise this will make sense in a few moments. We'll, we will get there. But when we look at Scripture, it's pretty awesome how Jesus told us to look at nature, to look at creation, um, to look at his creation and to learn things. Jesus said things like this. He said, a man went forth to sow. And then he told a parable about sowing and soil. Uh, Jesus also said, consider the lilies of the field. Look at them. Learn from them. Learn what that has to do with God. Uh, he said, look at the fowl of the air. Just look at the fowl there. Look at the birds. Look how they don't worry. They don't stress. They're not worried about their meals tomorrow. And you probably have seen the fowls, maybe even a bald eagle here in Poto and Monroe that I've seen several times. And it's so glorious to see God's creation and we're commanded to look at creation and help learn what that has to do with God. And that's what I want to do for a few moments this morning. And since we have the precedent to look at his creation, to learn things, I want to start by talking about the Mississippi River. Uh, this river, man, it is of extreme significance to our country. It's considered one of the top five rivers in the entire world. Uh, some would say that only the Nile River and the Amazon would be more significant than the Mississippi. The Mississippi River, it's 2,552 miles long. 18 million people rely on it for their daily water supply. 500 million tons of goods are shipped every single year through the Mississippi River. This one I thought was wild. 60%, 60% of all North American birds use the Mississippi Basin as their migratory flyway. 60% of all our birds are dependent on the Mississippi River. 
uh, 33 states as far west as Montana and as far east as New York depend on the Mississippi River for its watershed. At its widest point, the Mississippi is 11 miles wide. Pretty impressive. I won't bore you with more details about this, but go read about the importance of this river when it comes to our military history and how significant the Mississippi River is for that. Uh, some people, experts, even believe that if the Mississippi River shut down completely for a single month, for just one month, that our entire American economy would collapse. Pretty significant river, isn't it? Uh, pretty influential. Just think of all the great books and stories and fables that were written with the Mississippi River as its setting. I mean, even our literature history would be completely different without the Mississippi River. A lot of us have probably driven over it, maybe in St. Louis or Memphis, and you've just seen this river and how significant. You can't drive across it without maybe waking the kids up so they can see the Mississippi River as you drive across. A lot of us have done that. It is indeed mighty. It's powerful. But I say all that to say this. It's almost impossible to ignore the significance of this river. But one of the things we have to know is the Mississippi River is very unimpressive at its headwaters. And I mean like very unimpressive. I want you to travel with me to Lake Itasca, Minnesota. Has anybody ever been there? Hold your hand up. Anybody been to Lake Itasca? Yeah, some of you. You've seen where the Mississippi River starts. Or if you were at Lake Itasca and you didn't know that, I'm informing you today, that's where the Mississippi River starts, at Lake Itasca. And it's very unimpressive at its headwaters, um, at its beginnings, where the river starts. It's extremely unimpressive. In fact, there are places where it's only 10 feet wide. A lot of you could jump across the Mississippi River. We would never look at it and think, man, this river, it is destined for greatness. In fact, I got a couple more pictures. There's one where you could just walk across the Mississippi River. I think there's a couple more. That's the Mississippi River. That looks like an Oklahoma Creek. That's just a Mississippi. There it is again. That's its headwaters. That's where it starts. And then I've got one more, just in case you don't believe me. It actually says Mississippi River. I didn't just throw random river pictures in there. Um, pretty unimpressive at its start, isn't it? Its headwaters are not very significant. Here at the headwaters of the Mississippi River, you could back a semi-truck trailer up to the river, and it would take 10 minutes to fill one trailer full of water. But if you go down to New Orleans, to the Gulf of Mexico, you can fill 166 semi-trucks full of water every second. So my question is, how does it go from this to this? Here's another picture. Like when we think of the Mississippi River, that's what we think of, isn't it? We think of mighty, we think of significance. You think of boats traveling down the river. I think you even got one more picture maybe. Yeah, that's what you think of. When you think of the Mississippi River, you don't picture just jumping across it. You don't think of it just being this small little river. Um, and then one more picture that will kind of show you the route the Mississippi River takes all the way up from Lake Itasca, Minnesota, all the way down till it eventually dumps out in the Gulf of Mexico. So what happens to the Mississippi River that helps make it so great? How does it begin to swell and get stronger and stronger? Because wouldn't it appear that at the very beginning, at the very start of its journey, that this river is not very important? But we have to be careful. We have to be careful about judging based off beginnings. Because here's, here's what happens with this river. It does become mighty. You've seen it, maybe. It does become impressive. It gains significance, but it doesn't do it on its own. This is what I want us to get this morning. As the river, the Mississippi, flows along, every so often a different river pours into it empties itself into it. They're called tributary rivers. They contribute to the growth of the Mississippi River. In fact, there are over 250 tributary rivers that flow into the Mississippi. 
And with each one that empties itself into the river, the Mississippi gains strength, it grows, gets a little bigger each and every time. Rivers you've never heard of, probably. Rivers like Skunk River, Snake River, Bear River, Rum River, and my favorite one, Tick Faw River, all flow into the Mississippi. But you've never heard of those. We're not singing the praises of those rivers. They just flow. They just empty themselves into the Mississippi. They just pour into it. So let's talk about Moses for a few minutes. There is absolutely no denying how influential this man was and is. I mean, the impact he had. If you have any experience in church at all, you know some of the impact that Moses has had. What a mighty man he was. When he was at his best, when he had his maximum impact, he was something to behold. He was a mighty, mighty follower of God. In fact, did you know that in the New Testament, Jesus quoted Moses more than he quoted any other person? Wouldn't that be something if Jesus quoted you more than he ever quoted anyone else? That was Moses. Did you know that in what is considered the Bible's Hall of Fame chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, it lists like the Old Testament heroes and many of them, more print and space is given to Moses than to anybody else. He's pretty significant. Um, Scripture says that Moses knew God face to face. Uh, he was the person that God used for the ten plagues. You remember that? The locusts, frogs. He was the person that God used when it was time to part the Red Sea. He was the person that talked to God through a burning bush. He was the person that led millions of people through the desert. Uh, he was the person who trusted God for manna for those millions of people, food from heaven every day that he trusted God for. Uh, he was the person that God specifically gave the Ten Commandments to. When the people he was leading were complaining, they were complaining about how, how bad the water tasted, Moses threw a tree into the water, and the water became sweet. The people at one point got so wicked and so vile, they were doing evil things. Moses stood up, kind of drew a line in the stand, and said, okay, who is on the Lord's side? It's time to decide who is on the Lord's side. Moses was the one who hit the rock and water came out of it. This is a significant man. A few years ago, actually, both Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine had cover stories about Moses. And here's what it said. It said, if Moses was indeed real, which we believe he was, then he would go down as one of, if not the single greatest leader who's ever lived. Man, he was a truly mighty man, a man of significance. Imagine church history without Moses. Can't do it. He was a mighty, significant man. But there's something else we need to know. Moses is very unimpressive at his headwaters. I would invite you, if you'd like, turn to Exodus chapter 2. We'll also put the words on the screen for you. But Exodus chapter number 2. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. And we're looking at the very headwaters of Moses' life, the very beginning of his journey, the very start. And we'll start in Exodus chapter 2, verse number 1. And here's what it says. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it, placed it among the reeds by the riverbank, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now, you have to understand that Pharaoh at this time was killing all the young boys, the, oldest, the firstborn boys. And Moses' mom wanted to save her baby. Puts him in a basket, floats down the river. You've probably heard this story. And his sister stood at a distance, and then we're going to pick up in verse number 5. It says, Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. So he, she picked up Moses. What a 
Amazing act of faith by Moses' mom to do this. So he's raised in the house of Pharaoh as a baby, lives there for about 40 years. And being raised in the house of Pharaoh, it's not a bad gig. He had lots of luxury. But then we don't hear anything about him after this for 40 years. We hear the story about him being a baby in the river. And then in verse number 12 of chapter 2, we fast forward 40 years and pick up his story. So actually, let's start in verse number 11. Exodus chapter 12, verse number 11 says this. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. So he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So when he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? Well, he answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So we're at the headwaters of Moses' life in Exodus chapter 2. He murdered someone, hid the body. Now he's on the run. He's a fugitive. And then he meets a man named Jethro. You could keep reading. He marries his daughter and then works for Jethro for 40 more years. Not very impressive, is it? I mean, at his start, at his beginning, at his headwaters, it is not very impressive. But we have to be careful judging people based on beginnings. Man, if this is all we knew of Moses, if, if we forgot everything we knew about Moses and all we knew was the Exodus chapter 2 Moses, we would think this is a waste of life. At his headwaters, he looks hopeless. He looks lost like a lost cause. But what happened to Moses that caused him to grow in significance, that caused him to grow in influence, to be a person who changed the world? What happened in his life? Well, he didn't do it alone, just like the Mississippi River. In Moses' life, he had people who chose to flow into him. And while he was on the run, Jethro comes along and gives him a job, gives him some security, gives him shelter. Later on, a guy named Aaron comes along in his life and just pours his life into Moses, flows into Moses, holds Moses' hands up when Moses can't hold his own hands up, supports him. His sister, Miriam, his mom, Joshua, towards the end of his life, takes over for Moses as a leader. You see, what happened with Moses on the journey of his life, a person here and a person there just chose to flow into him. And little by little, Moses grew in significance until eventually he changed the world. There's something unique about the way God works. I love this, and you've probably seen it in your life too. He uses other people to be tributaries into your life and into my life because nobody makes it alone. And Cross Community Church, this church has an incredible history of just pouring into people, just pouring into them. They pour into kids, every type of kid, no matter where they come from, no matter who their parents are, no matter how they get here, we just flow, you just pour into them thinking maybe, maybe it's the next Moses in this classroom. If not, I'm just going to keep pouring. I'm going to keep flowing. They pour into students. Man, the students that have been reached through Cross Community Church, what a, what a reputation, what a, what a legacy Cross Community has of students who have come through this place. You pour into adults. It doesn't matter if they're known in the community or unknown. It doesn't matter what the reputation is or not. You flow into them, and there's opportunity after opportunity to pour into people. Because we have to be careful of judging people based off their starts. And I think we should take just a moment to thank God that beginnings do not determine outcomes. Because if they did, you wouldn't be here today. A lot of us wouldn't be here today. If beginnings determined outcomes, where would you be? And I, I bet there's some people in this room or maybe even listening online who you've come from some pretty messed up situations. You didn't ask to be raised by a single parent. But you were, and here you are. 
I mean, you didn't ask to be shipped off to your grandparents. You didn't ask to be walked out on. You didn't ask for that abusive situation. You didn't ask for any of it. But thank God that beginnings don't have to determine outcomes. It didn't for Moses. It didn't for the Mississippi River. Just because your start was messy doesn't mean your life has to be messy. And just because your life is a wreck doesn't mean the rest of your life has to be a wreck. We flow. We pour into people. And I bet you would also agree that somewhere along the way, a person here, a person there, just chose to flow into you, didn't they? And you, you probably couldn't do anything for them. You weren't making them look good. You weren't impressing people by being their friend. They just poured into you. I look at just three or four people throughout my life who I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for them. Um, there's one guy named Norman Rice. He was actually from this area. And he went to a church here in the area that my wife grew up in. And in fact, he was a bus driver on Sunday mornings. He'd go pick up kids and bring them to church. And that's how my wife and her whole family got reached, was this guy named Norman Rice. And then before, I didn't even know anything about Poto, never heard, of, never heard of Poto, that's for sure. I lived in Texas at the time, and this guy named Norman Rice shows up at my church in Texas that my dad was a pastor of, and just poured into me, taught, taught, taught the Bible to me, taught Sunday school class, was there for me. And as he got to know me a little bit more, he, he heard where I was going to college, and he said, hey, where I'm from in Poto, there's this other girl going to that same college. You should meet her and get married. So I went to college, and I met her, and I got married. And that was great. And this guy helped set that up, and he just poured in. I could do nothing for him. I couldn't make him look good. He just chose to flow. And Norman's gone now, and he's in heaven getting his reward. And man, I would love to thank him one more time for just pouring into me, for just flowing. I think of a guy named Floyd Schecksneider. He opened up his home when my wife and I were in college, and he didn't have to. He was like our adopted dad, mom and dad there. And one day for Valentine's, I was dating my wife in college, and, and we walk into his house, he invites us over, and him and his wife, and there's a huge table with the fanciest of china where you can imagine, and him and his wife are in black tie attire. He's got the towel over his arm, all official and stuff. And my wife walk in, and we're just two college students. He did not have to do that. He just chose to flow. And thing after thing in life, he flowed and poured into us and I don't know where I'd be without Floyd. And he's in heaven, getting his reward now. I'll never forget the day getting the call that he died. But I would love to thank him one more time, but where would I be without him? He just poured. He just flowed into us. And then I think of my dad. My dad died when he was 50 while he was pastoring the church, and he was bivocational. He worked a full-time job, pastored a full-time church, he just poured into people. Nobody knows his name. Nobody knows. Nobody's singing his praises. He just poured into people. He just flowed. And that's what I want to do. I just want to pour into people because of people who poured into me. So teachers, faculty, coaches, however you're impacting young people, thank you. Please keep pouring into them. Keep flowing. Keep, keep investing into them. There's someone right now who is at their Lake Itasca. They're at their headwaters. And they don't look very impressive right now. But what would happen if you just chose to flow? You know that person? I'm going to pour into them. I'm going to invest my life into that person. So who are you pouring into? Church, there's too much at stake to just be happy with the pouring we've already done. We have to keep pouring into people. We have to keep pressing forward. You have to find new ways to flow into people, creative ways to flow into people. You have to challenge new people to flow into new people and to keep growing and growing. It's too much at stake. Man, I know all the ministries at this church, kids ministry, student ministry, adult ministries, marriage ministries, recovery ministries, they're just flowing. But it's not just the job of the church staff to flow into people. It's all of our responsibilities to pour. There's probably someone sitting pretty close to you right now. You probably haven't met them. And they're feeling pretty low in life. They're out there like a tasca. They're barely making it. And they're struggling. It feels like they're not going to survive. 
And maybe they even feel like they've been stuck at their headwaters for a long time and can't get any progress. What if? What if someone like you just chose to flow? Pour your life into them. What momentum might that start in their life? And then later on, someone else will pour into their life and make a difference. And then a few years later, maybe somebody else will come along. And before you know it, the person has grown in significance and importance and influence because of people who chose to flow. The future of this church depends on us choosing to flow because in order to grow, there must be flow. So we have a choice. We can commit to flowing or we can commit to dying. You say, Nathan, that's pretty drastic. Dying as a church, really? Well, I want you to travel with me halfway around the world to the Middle East, and I've got a map, actually, of where we're going, to the Dead Sea in the Middle East. I think it's going to pop up there, maybe, maybe not. There it is. Okay, Dead Sea. Anybody ever been to the Dead Sea in this room? No, it's amazing. You should see it sometime. Um, but that's where it's located. And I got another picture here, a couple more. Um, it's actually the lowest point on earth. And if you know anything about the Dead Sea, it is extremely salty, just extremely. Nothing can survive in the Dead Sea. Nothing lives there. In fact, I think one more picture. It's gorgeous. There's a picture of it. That's the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth. You see, the Dead Sea has no life due to not having any outflow. What the Dead Sea does is it takes, it takes, and a river flows into it, and there's some springs that flow into it, but it never outflows. It never pours itself out. And because of that, nothing can survive in it. Everything dies because it just takes and takes and takes, never gives. Man, wouldn't it be a shame if we let a person here and a person there flow into our lives, yet we just take and take and take and never flow into someone else's life. You can flow like a river or you can consume, take, indulge, but you will live a very fruitless and dead life if we don't choose to flow. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute as I discuss or just talk about some action steps for us, actually. But as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, first thing I want to start off with is this. It's possible that there's, in fact, it's very possible that you're in this room right now and you're at the lowest point of your life. And the people sitting around you don't know it. You're able to come in with a smile, but you're fighting battles that nobody knows about. And you're at the lowest point of your life. But I want to tell you that you're sitting amongst people who want to flow into you. They want to help you. They want to offer you Jesus. They want to offer you scripture. They want to come alongside you and pour their life into you so that you can grow and flow into other people. And if that's you, I would invite you in just a moment when we have a time of reflection. If you're that low, I'd invite you to come forward and let me pray with you. Find somebody around you to pray with. Don't leave here staying that low. We want to help create some momentum in your life. We want to help you get out of some low points and have a fruitful relationship with God. But the second thing I want to ask you is this. Who are you pouring into? If we could get this as a church to just flow into people, it would put us past church politics. It would put us past Facebook posts that put us past all that stuff and we would just flow into people. Simplify the Christian life by flowing into people. So who's, flow, who's poured into you and who are you pouring into? Would you stand just quietly where you are as you remain with your heads bowed and eyes closed? I think just a very practical thing for us to do is to first of all thank God for those two, three, four people throughout your life who've been there for you like no one else has been? Where would you be without them? Why don't you take a moment to thank God for those people? And then take a moment and figure out who God is calling you to pour your life into because I bet there's someone. Maybe they're sitting around you. Maybe it's a family member that you've given up on. 
Maybe it's a friend who's betrayed you. Maybe it's somebody you know is going through a difficult time and you're not sure what to do. What if you just poured into them? What difference could that make in their life? So let's take just a couple of moments to reflect and maybe you need to pray right where you are. Maybe kneel at your seat or come forward and show people that you're serious about this God stuff and you want to pray about it. But let's take a couple moments right now and reflect.